Okay, so the paper I'm going to give today is on Michael Hart and Antonio Negri, who are a part of the autonomous Marxist movement. Um, I just want to make clear beforehand, um, this paper is a critique of their philosophy um, from a Marxist-Leninist perspective, so that's the sort of bias you're going to get. However, the further you know, first, um, I'm actually reading out the paper, um, I actually try to outline what I think is their main um, arguments for what they believe, what they believe. Um, after that, I'll give the critique. So um, I'm just going to read straight from the paper um, and we'll discuss afterwards. So, uh, it is a questionable that capitalism has changed from the time that Karl Marx first analyzed it with Das Kapital in 1867. Many Marxist thinkers in the 21st century have sought to update this analysis because of their view that capitalism has radically changed. Antonio Negri and Michael Hart also make this attempt. They have argued from empire on the situation of capitalism uh, has changed radically from the time of Das Kapital. They argue that immaterial labor has taken the dominant role in the production of wealth. Hart Negri proposed that out of this new form of capitalism emerges fundamentally new possibilities for revolutions. Hart Negri's project of defining empire and multitude runs completely opposed to the Mar orthodox Marxist tradition uh, characterized by Marxism Leninism. In this paper, I shall examine the project of Hart Negri and demonstrate that their projection of orthodox Marxism has simply led them to repeat the mistakes of Karl Kautsky in his analysis of ultra imperialism. Furthermore, it should be argued that Hart Negri's revolutionary program is a postmodern version of the flawed productive forces theory held by dogmatic Western Marxists, especially Karl Kautsky's, and, and reiterate its reputation of orthodox Marxism. Um, one must understand empire in order to understand the basic project of Hart Negri. Um, they begin their analysis of empire by claiming that we now live under a new order in the world. They state, quote, the problematic of empire is determined in the fact by one simple fact, there is now a world order. They point out that we live in an era of the United Nations, the European Union, among other supranational institutions such as the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and the World Bank. Hart and Negri see these institutions as emerging out of the need to create a world order. Consequently, the sovereignty of the nation state begins to erode uh, with the rise of these supranational institutions. Hart and Negri write that contemporary transformations of supranational law, the imperial process of constitution, tends to either directly or indirectly to penetrate and reconfigure the domestic law of the nation states, and thus supranational law powerfully overdetermines domestic law. In other words, Hart and Negri argue that the conventional nation states must see their sovereignty to a new universal norm or order. <coughs> These institutions arise out of and supersede nation states with the aim of establishing order in the world. Hart and Negri assert that empire is not born out of its own will, but rather it is called into being and constituted on the basis of a capacity to resolve conflicts. In addition, they argue that peace, equilibrium, and cessation of conflicts are the values toward which everything is directed. In order to secure this order, empire develops a new juridical apparatus uh, to police the world, but first empire must actually establish as that's the right to police. Um, they, they assert that uh, nation states can no longer act as an authority over another, but that they must mediate through empire. They also assert that war in general assumes a new logic under the just war theory, uh, Hart and Negri um, argue that empire accepts first, this is quote, um, legitim um, push a bit. first the legitimacy of military apparatus insofar as ethically grounded, and second, the effectiveness of military action to achieve the desired order in peace. They claim that the war is now a force of intervention used to establish uh, order as well as the new morality of empire. They assert that supernatural subjects that are legitimated not by right but by consensus intervene in the name of the type of emergency or superior ethical principles. Hart and Negri argue that uh, the withering of the nation state as the center, of, they argue that the withering of the nation state as the center of power, imperialism is over. Uh, more significantly, they assert that countries like the United States only occupies a privileged position in empire. Hart and view imperialism as that which the sovereignty of the nation state was the cornerstone of imperialism that European powers constructed through the modern era. For them, imperialism was really an extension of sovereignty of the European nation states beyond their own boundaries. The difference between imperial, uh, empire and imperialism is that empire establishes no territorial center of power and does not rely on fixed boundaries or barriers. It is a decentered, deterritorializing apparatus if rule uh, that progressively incorporates the entire global realm within its open, expanding frontiers. Empire envelops a global state of affairs. As a consequence, as revolutionaries no longer have a fixed point of power which they can strategically attack to bring empire down. Uh, in fact, uh, they claim it would be rather naive to think that only social movements in Washington, Geneva, Tokyo could attack the heart of empire. 
One will not find heart in every shedding tears of the Washington nation states. In fact, they praise empire over this fact. They attempt to struggle, uh, the very attempt to struggle for national liberations is a step backward for them. Uh, for them, they would say that the very concept of liberatory national sovereignty is ambiguous, if not completely contradictory. While nationalism seeks to liberate the multitude from foreign domination, it erects domestic structures of domination that are equally severe. Um, they reject the struggle for national liberation because they see it because uh, it tries to establish sovereignty from external influence. According to Hart and Negri, it produces a state which they claim is the poison gift of national liberation. Finally, Hart and Negri claim that the declining effectiveness of this structure can be traced clearly through the evolution of a whole series of global juridical uh, bodies such as GATT, which is the global um, something uh, tariffs and uh, global agreement on trade and tariffs. Uh, yeah. Um, the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, and the IMF. Um, these bodies allow for the spread of capitalism, which does not, or doesn't involve the use of nation states, but have become primary to empire from the analysis of empire, uh, the move to modes of resistance to it. Hart and Negri reject forms of resistance, espouse the position that modern capitalism exists in a biopolitical form, and that the methods of resistance take multiple forms. Hart and Negri quickly reject any statist ideo ideology such as Leninism. Um, they argue that if empire exists as a completely hegemonic phenomenon, which disperses its power in a network of relationships rather than a fixed point of power, no, quote, old ideas uh, can liberate humanity from empire. They claim that the revolutionary project must take into account the new situation. Hart and Avery make use of the French philosopher Michel Foucault and his concept of power um, to make sense of the new situation. For Foucault, uh, quote, power must be understood in the first instance in the multiplicity of force relations eminent in the sphere of organization as the process which, through ceaseless struggle and confrontations, transforms, strengthens, or reverses them. Uh, the relations that people engage in and produce power rather than some external force that imposes power onto people. In addition, Foucault asserts the omnipresence of power not only because it has the privilege of consolidating everything under its invincible unity, but because it is produced from one moment to the next at every point or rather, in every relation, from one point to the next, power is everywhere, not because it embraces everything, but because it comes from everywhere. Hart and Negri adopt the concept of power, for, and for them, it is now exercised through machines that directly organize brains and bodies towards a state of autonomous alienation from the sense of life and the desire for creativity. Another concept they borrowed from Foucault was biopower, Foucault saw that the biopower was integral to the development of capitalism because the latter would not have been possible without the controlled insertion of bodies in the machinery of production and the adjustment of the phenomena of populations to economic processes. What biopower is, is the actual power over life and its reproduction. Hart and say that biopower thus refers to a situation in which what is directly at stake in power is the production and reproduction of life itself. Hart and don't necessarily see this as a bad thing because, quote, Foucault fails to grasp the real dynamics of production in biopolitical society. What Hart and mean with biopolitical is the production of social life itself in which the economic, the political, and the cultural increasingly overlap and invest in one another. Where Foucault comes up short, Hart and looked at uh, Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari for guidance. Uh, Hart and believed that the work of Deleuze and Guattari sidesteps the baggage of structuralism and can focus our attention clearly on the ontological substance of social production. However, they only manage to articulate it superficially and ephemerally as a chaotic, indeterminized horizon marked by an ungraspable event. Hart and see that the social production itself is becoming a new side of struggle and potential revolution due to the nature of immaterial labor. Hart and claim that uh, in empire that the central role previously occupied by labor of mass workers in the, produ in the production of surplus value is today increasingly filled by intellectual, immaterial, and communicative labor power. The theme runs through their entire work, including Commonwealth. Hart and do not mean that, immater that material labor has vanished, but the kind of labor done today produces images, information, knowledge, affects, code, and social relationships. Again, all of this corresponds to what Hart and referred to as biopolitical production. Because Hart and Negri see capital as ceasing to, um, ceasing, to organize, ceasing to be the organizing role in the production process, the revolutionary potential for this kind of labor arises. Cognitive labor and effective labor generally produce cooperation autonomously from capital's command. In fact, what Hart and Negri assert that in order for these works to be truly productive, capital must unshackle them from management. In a standalone essay, which is uh, common in communism, um, 
Michael Hart says that biopolitical production exceeds the bounds of capitalist relations and constantly refers to the common. Grants labor increasing autonomy and provides the tools or weapons that can be wielded in the project of liberation. The view that capital is now is, is that it exploits the workers by expropriating the commons or the fruits of these laborers as the new problem of capitalism. So for instance, open source software like Inkscape or GIMP can be accessed for free rather than purchasing the expensive copyrighted software made by Adobe. This kind of common property well, cannot be privatized and controlled as property, but is more difficult to police. Or it can be privatized and controlled as property, but it is more difficult to police because they are so easily shared and reproduced. This form of property is no longer scarce, so there is no uh, capitalist logic to be had in rationing it through a market mechanism. However, capital does not exploit the common, uh, does indeed exploit the common, which becomes a central theme around commonwealth. Har and Negri assert that the exploitation of labor power and the accumulation of surplus value should be understood in terms of not profit, but capitalist rent. Much in the same way that people find shelter by renting an apartment, now the property relations of capital entail that one can only access the common by paying a rental fee. As Hart says, patient or patents and copyrights, uh, for example, generate rent in the sense that you not guarantee or that they guarantee an income based on the ownership of material or immaterial property. One doesn't rent food when one is hungry because one must consume or one consumes the use value of the product. However, the use value of software remains intact after multiple uses. Uh, with the rise of immaterial labor, Hart and Negri want to argue that we need to understand the new nature of classes. No longer, can we rely on the rigid, no longer can we rely on the rigid dichotomy of wage workers versus the capitalists. Antonio Negri offers the concept of multitude to encompass this new diversity of workers. He says, the factory no longer is, factory state is no longer in the center of value of production. The value is created by, by putting to work the whole of society. We call multitude all the workers who are put to work inside of society to create profit. We consider all the workers in the whole society to be exploited. Men, women, people who work in services, people who work in nursing, people who work in linguistic relationships, people who work in the cultural field and as much as all social relations. And insofar as they are exploited, we consider them part of the multitude and as much as they are singularities. We see the multitude as a multiplicity of exploited singularities. The singularities are singularities of labor. Anyone is working in a different ways and the singularity is the singularity of exploited labor. The reasoning behind multitude can be seen in empire when Hart and Negri talk about the new composition of labor. They write that some labor is wage, some is not. Some labor is restricted to the factory walls. Some is uh, dispersed across the unbounded social terrain. Some labor is limited to eight hours a day and 40 hours a week. Some labor uh, expands to fill the entire time of life. And some labor is uh, accorded a minimal value while some is exalted as a pinnacle of capitalist economy. That the labor now required to produce and reproduce capital cannot be configured to the old category from the key concept uh, they want to express. They account for unwaged workers engaged in so-called domestic work by asserting the problematic nature of social labor. Hart and Negri see that capital as extending its exploitation to all aspects of life. And, and just what they mean by domestic labor is, um, it, it comes with the concept that uh, in order for people to actually get back to work, uh, to get back on the job, there needs to be some minimal level of people doing labor outside of the actual workplace. Um, so one of the things to be considered would be like uh, domestic works as a, a spouse doing you know, dishes, cleaning, cooking and food. Um, basically they're ready to get the worker for the next day of work and getting them back to work. So that's sort of domestic labor in a nutshell. So what does revolution against empire look like and how does it, and does it occur? How does multitude factor into the equation? Hart Negri claimed that the multitude called empire into being, playing off of Hegel, and this is ironic because they're ferociously anti-Hegelians, um, they claim that empire is good in itself because empire played a role in putting an end to the colonialism and imperialism. Now that empire has enveloped the globe, alternatives to empire have no choice but to come from within. Moreover, Hart and Negri see any attempt to establish an outside empire as completely futile. Hart and Negri see not a new rationality but a new scenario of different rational acts, a horizon of activities, resistances, wills and desires that refute the hegemonic order, propose lines of flight and forge alternatives uh, constitutive itineraries. Lines of flight is another uh, concept borrowed from Blues and Watery. In their book, A Thousand Plateaus, Blues and Watery say that every rhizome contained lines of segmentary, uh, segmentarity, according to which it is stratified, territorialized, organized, signified, and attributed, etc., as well as lines of deterritorialization which const, uh, down which it constantly flees. Hart and Negri interpret uh, Blues and Watery's rhizome as a non-hierarchical, non-centered network structure. Blues and Watery say that there are no points of 
uh, Lewis and say that there are no points or positions in a rhizome, such as those found in the structure of tree or roots, there are only lines. This concept is extremely important to heart memory because, as they say, the assembly line has been replaced by the network as the organizational model of production. Because immaterial labor is so dominant in empire, these networks are able to undermine empire internally because the cooperative aspect of immaterial labor is not imposed or organized from the outside, as it was with previous forms of labor, but rather cooperation is completely eminent to the laboring activity itself. This becomes the core of Hartnick's idea of resistance. Multitude is developing its own means of resistance by simply engaging in material labor. Hartnick would do not simply think that multitude will work its way out of empire. It must formally rupture with empire. Uh, they developed the idea further in the book Commonwealth. They write that the class struggle in the biopolitical context takes the form of exodus. By here, exodus we mean, as, at least initially, a process of subtraction from the relationship with capital by means of actualizing the potential autonomy of labor power. This is to say that the multitude must break its parasitic relationship with capital by making a grand exit. Hart and Negri continue, Exodus is possible only on the basis of the common, both access to the common and the ability to make use of it. The capitalist society seems driven to eliminate or mask the common by privatizing the means of production and in, indeed all aspects of life. Hart and Negri put forward the idea that the relations of production are continually being strained by the new forces of production, which ultimately lead to a rupture with the existing order. But this rupture doesn't simply happen by itself. The multiplicity of singularities that they produce, or that produce, uh, are produced on the, bio the biopolitical field of the common, do not spontaneously accomplish exodus and construct their autonomy. Political organization is needed to cross the threshold and generate political events. All of this must happen within an element of kairos. Uh, kairos is, as they put it, which comes from the Greek word, is the opportune moment uh, that ruptures the monotony and the repetitiveness of chronological time. The term singularities has been mentioned a couple times now, and it's worth fleshing out just what it means. For Hart and Negri, singularities are composed of three characteristics. First of all, every singularity points toward and is defined uh, by a multiplicity outside of itself. No singularity can exist or can be conceived of on its own terms, but instead both its existence and definition necessarily derive from its relations and other singularities that constitute society. Second, every singularity points toward a multiplicity within itself. The innumerable divisions that cut throughout a singularity do not undermine, but actually constitute its definition. Third, singularity is always engaged in a process of becoming different, a temporal <coughs> multiplicity. One case uh, to see a concrete manifest manifestation of this idea is by working backwards through the concept of institutions that they explore in Commonwealth. Institutions emerge out of revolts that happen, such as Stonewall, the South African apartheid struggle, the Italian worker revolts, or the Zapatistas. Uh, institutions institutionalizes the, uh, the struggle and allows it to continue. So, for example, uh, they use what the Zapatistas is that uh, they develop through the creation of autonomous assemblies, coroculas, uh, or base community structures, and the hunters of a good government. So, for Hart Negri, institutions are based on conflict in the sense that they both extend the social option operated by the revolt against the ruling powers and are open to eternal score. Institutions also constitute collective habits, practices, capacities that designate a form of a life. Institutions are finally open in it in that they continually transfer by it the singularities that compose them. The concept seems to imply of singularity seems to imply something that which is atomic and autonomous, while at the same time being interdependent and constitutive. Um, now for the question of organization, Hart may choose to reject the traditional organizational forms based on unity central leadership and hierarchy because they are neither desirable nor effective. The concept of exodus must remain in its biopolitical mode and take advantage of the autonomous aspect of labor. The question that Hart and needs to answer is, how then can the multitude organize itself without sacrificing the autonomy of singularities that compose it? The problem of organization is actually solved by biopolitical labor. The three characteristics of biopolitical labor, the cooperation, autonomy, and network organization, provide solid building blocks for democratic political organization. They assert that there exists no need for an elite group of individuals to come along and organize the multitude. Multitude organizes itself every day by engaging in its creative labors. Hart and Negri's program can be summed up in the following. Our political task is not to resist these processes, but to reorganize them and redirect them toward new ends. The creative forces of the multitude that sustain empire must also be must also, yeah, are also capable of autonomously constructing a counter empire, an alternative political organization of the global flows and exchanges. 
This, however, remains radically insufficient. <coughs> Hart Negri's philosophy reiterates a mistaken idea in Marxism known as the productive forces theory. The productive forces theory can be traced back to a, uh, Marx's preface to a contribution on critique of political economy in 1859. And in Marx wrote that, at a certain stage of their development, the material productive forces of society come in conflict with the existing relations of production, or with the property relations within they have been at work hitherto. From forms of, of development of the productive forces, these relationships turn into their fetters. Then begins the epoch of social revolutions. First, to clarify the terminology, what is meant by productive forces is the labor power of the proletariat, the technology used as well as the materials that form a commodity. The problem of capitalism arises in how these three elements come together to make up the process of production. Marx understands that the relations of production as how people interact within the productive process. The relations of production are determined by the status of property that is the ownership over the means of production. Under capitalism, the proletariat produces the commodities which benefit the capitalist class when they extract a surplus value from the sale of the commodity. The state mediates this relationship by enforcing the laws of private property. Marx like growing antagonism between the forces of production and the relations of production that can lead to our revolution that is necessary uh, lead to a revolution and that as a necessary condition for revolution, it was necessary for the productive forces to intensify. Marx stated this when he said, No social order ever perishes before all the productive forces of which there is no room in it have developed. And the new higher relations of production never appear before the material conditions of their existence have matured in the womb of the old society itself. In order for communism to emerge, capitalism must first develop its productive forces to such a high degree that it would strain the relations of production and into an upsurge of revolutionary activity. This became a dominant viewpoint until 1871. However, Marx ultimately came to reject this view. In Chapter 3, Section 1 of State and Revolution, Lenin shows the experience of the Paris Commune had greatly altered Marx's thinking. Marx warns that the Paris workers, that any attempt to over the uh, Paris workers of 1871, the comrades, reference to the Paris government. The Paris workers that attempt to overthrow the government would be folly of despair. When the communards seized the Paris for two months, Lenin notes that Marx did not persist in the pedantic attitude of condemning an untimely movement. Instead, once you draw the lessons of that the productive forces theory of revolution became invalidated by the concrete experience of the Paris Commune. The success of the rebellion and the revolution showed that the productive forces theory grew even more discredited by the Russian Revolution of 1917, the Chinese Revolution of 1949, and the Cuban Revolution of 1959. All of these revolutions occurred in relatively backwards countries which lacked advanced productive forces. However, one might argue that Hart Negri did not subscribe to the productive forces theory, yet this is not the case. Hart Negri's analysis of immaterial labor leads them to conclude that there are new possibilities for revolution, as multitude creates the commons of easily reproducible goods that can be disseminated freely. This creates a problem for capitalism in that it has a hard time imposing con the constraints of private property. So the task for multitude must keep producing until the time is right, until the time of Kairos. As these productive forces increase, the relations of production will begin to alter to the point of a revolutionary rupture. This creation of alternatives within empire overlooks at least two things. The first is that the commons, to some extent, exists. Any person with a computer can download just about anything from free computer software to music to movies. Capitalism still remains unchecked by this. The second problem that I see is that it necessarily excludes a large majority of the world and privileges the first world as the source of revolution. This is problematic because not everybody has access to the commons, as it were, and with the ability to engage in immaterial labor. More importantly, the world of immaterial labor is made possible for the, uh, the world, yeah, sorry, more importantly, the world of immaterial labor is made possible for the material world of labor. Computer programmers don't program the computers that they don't have. These computers were made with the materials that come from all over the world. So while the multitude are running around all hours of the day engaging in cognitive labor on their smartphones, there are children in Africa being murdered over conflict minerals to make that smartphone. This leads to the second problem with Hart Negri. The other problem with Hart Negri is their bold assertion that imperialism is over in the world. We have to ask our question, ourselves the question then, what is imperialism? The best answer that can be offered to this question is the one given by Lenin in his seminal work, Imperialism, the Highest Age of Capitalism. Its main components as Lenin lays out are the following. Uh, one is the con concentration of production and capital has developed to such a high stage that it has created monopolies which play a decisive role in economic life. Two is the merging of bank capital with industrial capital and the creation of a basis on, of this for finance capital or of a financial oligarchy. 
The export of capital is distinguished from the export of commodities requires exceptional importance. Number four is that the formation of international monopolist associations which share the whole world among themselves. And five, the territorial divisions of the world among the biggest uh, capitalist powers is completed. The age of uh, industrial capital and free competition has given rise to a monopoly of industry. Banks have become important in that they are able to grow from a modest middleman into powerful monopolies, having at their command the whole of the money of the capital of all the capitalists. The capital that they are holding becomes finance capital that allows them to begin investing in various enterprises. Lennon notes that experience shows that it is sufficient to own 40% of the shares of a company in order to direct its affairs. This becomes important because it allows for a chain of ownership leading the banks down to dollar companies of buying up shares of that company. Moreover, this holding system not only serves enormously to increase the power of the monopolist, it also enables them to resort with impunity to all sorts of shady and dirty tricks to cheat the public. Because formerly the directors of the mother company are not legally responsible for the daughter company, which is supposed to be independent and through the medium on which they can pull off anything. If one wants to engage in risky behavior to avoid responsibility, one needs to only invest into another company and conduct operations through that company. This holding system allows for the investment into other countries, which gives rise to multinational corporations, Moreover, these financial oligarchies also buy up banks as well as other uh, as banks as, uh, banks in other countries. The banks begin exporting surplus capital off to the countries in the form of loans. Lennon writes that the goal of finance capital is skinning the oxen twice. First is to pocket the profits from the loan, then it pockets other profits from the same loan from which the borrower uses to make purchases. With the return of super profits, Lennon gives the argument or argues that it is a possible to bribe the labor leaders in the upper stratum of, lab of the labor aristocracy. It should be noted here that the labor aristocracy exists in the first world countries and is made possible by, uh, because of imperialism in the third world. Many of the so-called immaterial labor positions that heart every price so highly are made possible by the super profits acquired through imperialism. And just to sort of flesh that out, um, when, you, when you're making loans to a country through imperialism, uh, one, you're getting money back for the interest paid on the loans, but then you're also uh, selling them commodities from that loan, so you just get money back from that. And so you're generating an enormous amount of super profits, which you bring into a country, and then what you can do is with that extra money, you begin paying off workers in various industries to keep them polite and just keep them going about their business. And that's, uh, in a sense, what the labor aristocracy is, is it's just well-paid workers in first world countries. Um, it should be noted that finance capital exists as a form of immaterial labor. Um, Hart and Negri seem to have the profound belief that the revolution will be made by the ranks of the labor aristocracy. The fact of the matter is this. The site of revolution in this day and age is not the computer programmer designing open source software. It's the guerrillas fighting a struggle for national liberation from U.S. imperialism the, the jungles of Colombia using the orthodox Marxism-Leninism as their guide. <coughs> Finally, Hart and Negri's conception of empire is not a new idea and it has been radically refuted by history. Karl Kautsky had a similar notion in mind when he theorized culture imperialism. Lenin spends a significant portion of imperialism slashing through Kautsky's analysis. Hard day, we unfortunately made the same mistakes. Lenin, quoting Kautsky, the urge of capital to expand can be best promoted not by the violent methods of imperialism, but by peaceful democracy. This leads Kautsky, again, Lenin quoting him, to conclude that the phase of ultra imperialism, of a union of imperialisms of the whole world, and not the struggles among them, a phase when war shall cease under capitalism, a phase of the joint exploitation of the world by international united finance capital. This is precisely what Hart and Negri are arguing that is happening as a tendency in the empire in the, in the empire in the world today. They claim that empire is coming into existence to put the world into order and to pursue peace. Kotsky's analysis irritated Lenin because it was completely opportunist as well as social chauvinist. Uh, and essentially the reasoning behind that was because but you're living in Germany and Germany's imperializing the rest of the world. And what you're saying is, no, no, we should let this, this, let this continue to happen because it's going to yield this sort of ultra-imperialism that will end all wars. Um, you're basically just saying, yeah, I've got good, so tell the rest of the world. Um, Lenin summed up this point by saying it is the most reactionary method of counseling the masses with hopes of permanent peace being possible under capitalism by distracting their attention from the share of antagonisms and acute problems of the present times and directing it towards an illusory prospect of an imaginary ultra-imperialism ultra of the future. 
Harvey Negri are certainly enthusiastic about the prospect of empires and creates a new situation for revolution, which as they see sidesteps the old mistakes of the 20th century. For the first time, a global democracy and peace is possible based on all biopolitical labors of the first world. Nevertheless, they fail to grasp uh, how tight this is claimed or uh, they fail to grasp how tight they claim order is uh, It seems clear that the United States doesn't form the center of power of empire. The United Nations would have significantly more success in reigning in their excesses. Over the, uh, years of the nation, uh, over the years, the nations of the United Nations have voted overwhelmingly to end the United States blockade against Cuba 19 times. It's clear that the United Nations doesn't have the capacity to impose a legally binding agreement on the United States. Uh, Hartnegger also claimed that agencies like the IMF are now becoming dominant force in the world. The IMF isn't some neutral global entity spawned out of nowhere. Hartnegger overlooked the fact that the United States Treasury Department remains the largest shareholder in the IMF and thus continues to pull its strings. The holding system described by Lenin remains in wide use today because we live in the age of imperialism. Imperialism is not about extending sovereignty beyond the borders of nation states. Indeed, imperialism is the reign of finance capital. The United States did not become directly involved when it went to see Venezuela in 2002 over the interest of national security or more specifically the oil that Venezuela has. The United States uses the IMF and the National Endowment for Democracy as a buffer to keep its image clean, and it's just simply baffling how hard every man should not take this into account. What Hart and Negri proposed as an analysis for the new situation of capitalism and empire is nothing more than what Karl Kotsky was proposing as ultra imperialism. The fact remains that we are living in the highest age of capitalism, imperialism. This remains self evident from the fact that we are uh, Lenin's. Uh, sorry, sorry, this seems evident from the fact of Lenin's analysis that he showed that imperialism is the reign of finance capital. What Hart and Negri proposed that the labor aristocracy will somehow save us through its biopolitical production, the problem of empire seemed absurd. Hard and negative, we clearly don't have a sufficient analysis of the world situation and that their solution reflects, uh, so their solutions reflect this poor analysis. It seems quite clear that if one engage in revolutionary activity, it would be best to find the focus and identify it away from hard and negative. It's not that it won't lead to a revolution, it's just the fact that it's trying to acquire a state outside of an empire. I mean, this, this is why I think this is bogus. I mean, you have Cuba as a state who's managed to resist empire. It's as best as it can for an island. Um, you have lots of countries in South America doing just as well. Um, I mean, I, obviously, like, Negri's like, in favor of, like, Lula, Soto, and Brazil, because it's paid on the IMF. But essentially, it's, no, we don't want to have a state. Like, what, and moreover, it's the fact that we should push it towards this more of a global community. As in like, yeah, we should get out of the global democracy now because empires drift everywhere. So in so a so sorry, so, so like the idea that, you know, their their national liberation would be our struggle, is that what they advocate kind of like national liberation should involve anyone outside those national borders. Well it's, it's simply it's they see it as an attempt they say they see it as an attempt to try to get outside of empire, which they say is one so you can't do it. So all these alternatives have to come with an empire. Okay. And so, and then too, I mean, they literally say that, like, yeah, the state is the poison gift of national liberation, and that's a direct quote from them. Um, so they they would be against like FARC. Um, well, and uh, I think there's a couple things to be said. First off, the reason why they're against national liberation struggle is because they're dumb, really dumb. Uh, but the second thing is, for those who aren't familiar with national liberation struggles. Um, it's a particular sort of struggle that emerges um, in an age of imperialism. And at, what happens is you have an empire or you know, an imperial power that takes over someplace, and then you have a nation, which is a group of people who share like the same language or the same culture or uh, just the same history, and they want to determine themselves. Well, they're not allowed to determine themselves because these outside forces determine it for them. So in the most uh, naked sort of fashion, it would be like South Africa 
right, where you have a literal colonial power that is occupying and then, you know, uh, forces essentially black Africans to do whatever the whites want. But the softest way would be like, again, through the IMF, where you just buy up all their banks. Your ba the banks make them do everything that you want them to do. And as such, they become puppets. Latin America is where this happened most predominantly. Although, I mean, you have like Pinochet, who is the old kind of throwback. Yeah, so, the, the IMF specifically, actually, I mean, most people throw out, like it's an international monetary fund, and essentially they go to developing nations and offer them loans. But also they have to they make the governments comply with certain reforms, such as, oh yeah, you need to do a right, um, start opening up your markets, these sort of things. So that's just what happened to those. Right, and so what happens is this national liberation struggle is a, 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 need, or a, a struggle for these people to throw off the chains of their oppression. Um, but here's where Negri has the problem. He says, look, you're, you're fighting for a nation, right? It's a national liberation struggle. What you don't understand is empire is now global. And so for you to fight for your particular struggle in this particular way is backward looking because you're not recognizing, hey, I've got to fight for a global international struggle rather than an individual struggle. Um, and again, the, the good example that he, he uses, right, is the Zapatistas. Because the Zapatistas aren't looking for real freedom uh, for Mexico. They're not looking for their nation state. They're not looking to cause a revolution. They're not looking to end capitalism in Mexico. What they're looking for is to be recognized by the juridical apparatus of Mexico and the global community, which of course in less fancy terms go, goes under human rights, right? So there this human rights struggle you know, for indigenous people, and then you have solidarity through the global community and through the internet, and you know, you have activists flying in because empire allows for travel and the free flow of ideas, and you know, there's all this political theater. Um, and so that's what we need to do to like oppress groups is you know, set up web pages for them and et cetera, et cetera. The problem is the Zapatistas are still under domination, they're still under constant threat. But you take like Hugo Chavez or um, Evo Morales, the problem that Negri sees is they're erecting a state and a state is repressive. And a lot of times it, in a socialist state, it's repressive towards capitalism. And in a lot of ways, for example, it cuts off information and connection and this free flow, because there's not a free flow of capital, there's not a free flow of ideas. Like, for example, you blockade Cuba, you blockade Venezuela, you blockade you know, Bolivia, and suddenly they can't get a lot of the supplies that are necessary for this sort of global network of empire. And instead of you know, having these smart solutions where you put everything on the internet, for example, uh, you have old-fashioned institutions, which is like direct or representative democracy that carries out the policies that help the people or, you know, just otherwise screwing with capitalism. And because they don't embrace this very, in, in, a, real, in a really strong sense, it's a very narrow view of what global struggle should look like. Because Chavez, because Evo Morales, because, because the FARC or the et a. Uh, don't accept this very narrow form of internationalism or global revolution, they're completely dismissed and they're backward looking and the poison through. Yeah, um, then just to sum it up, um, one, they never completely reject socialism as, as a sort of, like what they're not looking for is a sort of class of diamond, well, okay, well, there's the negation of capitalism through socialism and then the negation of negation, and the living in the state, and we're right with communism. They think that it has to come at all at once in like a sort of momentary global rupture just an exodus from capital, they can then really flesh this out. But also, I mean, when they claim that multitude called empire and building, being, what they're actually specifically referring to is the fact that uh, all these calls for internationalism, for, for you know, um, proletarian internationalism, that's what led to his empire. So that's sort of what they're going for. So what do you, what do you consider Che Guevara as saying, because he wasn't Cuban, it wasn't like necessarily his revolution, but he left Argentina, obviously, and went to several other places. And kind of, I don't really know how to say what I'm thinking. But anyways, I mean, he, he, would, he, would, he would be for those things, but I mean, I don't know, I'm just trying to... Do you 
you mind if I? Yeah, yeah, please. So I, I think what you're asking is, would Negri approve of Che Guevara because yeah. he had an international spirit. He left his own homeland to help fight first off in Cuba and then in Africa and then in um, Bolivia. So would he, would Negri say, oh, this is the sort of international um, characteristics we want to have? I think, I don't, I don't know specifically if Negri has talked about it. I think the answer is absolutely not. And the reason why is because in each instance that Che was fighting, he was fighting for a concrete people to establish a concrete set of conditions to help their concrete people, rather than this global, like, he, he, he wouldn't like Che Guevara, but he would like uh, a rich, erudite New Yorker who flies to all the G8, G8 places and riots, because, you know, it's an integrated network, you know, and, and is connected to all these black box groups you know, throughout uh, throughout the world, because that's a network. It's non-hierarchical. It's non-domination. For Che, it was hierarchical. First, he was a soldier. He was below, you know, Castro and Raul, and he took orders and he fought how he was supposed to. And then, as a leader, he issued orders again to create a structure whereby capitalism was suppressed through strength. Of people. So I, I think he. Would, he would hate Che Guevara, although it would be really unpopular to say so, and I doubt he would ever say so. Right, you right, but he, he also views internationalism as a bad thing. Yeah, it's bad was looking because again, like we should be working towards global democracy and global goals. But also, I mean, their rejection of the state comes from the idea that, well, yeah, it doesn't really respond to the people's imminent respond to the actual imminent desires of what the actual people really want. It's a complicated notion of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Josh. So yeah, like uh, I get I get how this is uh, how they're not Leninists, like that's pretty obvious. And of course like I take like huge issue with Martin Negri because of the national liberation question. I don't really get how it's not Marxist though. It is it's pretty thoroughly Marxist. I mean even when Marx talked about like India it was this idea like, oh well it's good, you know, like even though they did all these like that the British did this horrible thing to India, it was good because they were able to develop their productive forces to, you know, so that they could possibly have, you know, yeah. You see what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I see what you're saying, but also it's Marxist up until 1871. Like, again, this, this theory gets rejected wholeheartedly. Um, and then there's several people that held on to it, and again, this is why I think it's a bad theory, is because one, it's just saying, hey, everything should keep going the way it is because we're going to biofuel production, people are working more autonomously, and you know, there's no center of power anymore. But also, um, that's, that view is totally wrong because we still live in imperialism where people are dying every day for uh, mass profits. And so to say that we should keep letting these productive forces build and build and build, that will eventually change the relations of production, one, just isn't historically accurate. I don't think there's been a revolution that's came from that. But two, um, history has actually shown that um, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, all of course, but what they're saying is that is that within capitalism is contained communism, and the more that capitalism spreads and develops the productive forces all over the world, the more it's just actually communism eventually, you know? It seems I mean, to be if, the idea. If your idea of communism is just file sharing. Yeah, it's not my idea, but it seems like that's what they're saying, and it seems like that is not, there's nothing non Marxist about it. Right. Right. One thing to keep in mind is Orthodox Mar Marxist means Marxist Leninist. So it's not Orthodox Marxist like there's no other form of Marxism, but Orthodox Marxism, uh, as opposed to uh, the Frankfurt School, right, um, cultural uh, theory, critical theory, also opposed to Western Marxism, which interestingly enough is not Orthodox Marxism, which would be like your Brownskis, your Sartres, um, and then also, uh, sorry, this is really distracting. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, what I would say is, they're Marxists, they're just bad Marxists. And I, I'm not one who was a bad Marxist Leninist. No, they're not bad Marxist Leninists, they're bad Marxists. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, I mean, here's the thing, Rosa Luxemburg did not agree with Lenin on a lot of issues, but she, she, I think she was a relatively good Marxist. I think she had failed policies, I think she had failed plans for revolution, but also she had a really good Marxist analysis, which is why she sided with Lenin in internationalism and was against Konsky. But what the problem with Negri and Hart isn't that you know they disagree with me or my view or Lenin. It's that they're bad. Um, but I mean, because you'll notice uh, we have a, a friend uh, who is a Trotskyist, and he essentially espouses the same position, this same tired position.
position that has been espoused um, from early Marxists like Bernstein up to um, Kotsky's uh, assertions, uh, the Western Marxist assertions, right? I mean, the critique of the European Marxists of the Soviet Union from essentially 50 to, to now is, well, the reason why the Soviet Union is so awful and China is so awful and Cuba is so awful and we're all good Marxists because they haven't developed their productive forces. Yeah, that's a position you can have. You can justify it within the body of Marxism. Also, it's a stupid, sucky position. And it, uh, it I mean, I'll just, I'll say it. It ha underlies a, a sort of social chauvinism and racism. So, yeah, I, I, I would say that Marxism is just yeah. bad. I mean, again, like any essay tying specifically back to his practice in the cathedral, uh, contribution to, the contribution of a critique to political economy. I mean, that was his view. Like, he said, look, um, revolution is going to happen at the first country's first, uh, world first world, because eventually people just get immiserated and want to take over. But also, I mean, they use uh, the, econ uh, the economic and philosophical manuscripts pretty heavily, too. Um, especially in Michael Hart's essay on the idea of communism. He's talking like, look, oh, well, Marx said this about you know, mobile labor versus immobile labor. So we should start taking these ideas more. And essentially what they were also arguing was that, what Hart argues is that, look, um, the way industrial society has become to um, influence all relationships uh, needs to be in production. They argue that immaterial labor is going to do the same thing, that it's going to uh, get, uh, start uh, being the regulating force and influencing all of our relationships. So, like, if with the immaterial or the actual material production begins, like, uh, okay, well, this is the working day, it was from you know, five in the morning until one in the night or something like that. Uh, but yeah, it begins to actually influence how the rest of society. So I was thinking that immaterial labor is going to be the same thing, but I mean, it's just really a bad analysis. It just makes for more autonomous capital, you know, people actually doing stuff. Their, their, I mean, I was going to mention this. Their, their idea of class, too, I think is just, it's bogus. Um, basically, they don't see, like, they, they don't accept the whole dichotomy of, well, you know, you're the actual capitalist, you own things, and you're the worker, you're exploited. It's just that everybody participates in society and sort of contributes to capitalism, and there are actual people that don't contribute to capitalism. So, I mean, even, you know, uh, Pierre likes to bring up this example. It's like, well, you know, I own stock now, so I'm technically a part of the capitalist class, if, if you want to go by the old analysis. Um, so this, this sort of notion of rejection that there aren't really, like, uh, uh, there's enough. Again, the point is, is there's no center to power anymore. It's all in relationships. Um, so uh, I don't see how that flushes out that revolution when it's like, oh, yeah, these are the capitalists. We should make them stop being capitalists. It's just, well, we've got to work through this. All right, Mike Bryan. Um, so this is uh, autonomous mar Marxism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that they spouse. How is that uh, similar to Trotskyism, or would they agree with the permanent revolution theory? Trotsky. To be honest, I haven't studied a lot of Trotsky. But I don't know if you want to... Yeah, um, they actually wouldn't uh, go with Trotskyism. Uh, well, okay. They're, they would in some things. The analysis is the main thing. The, an, the analysis of capital. But their prescriptions are totally different. Um, depending on the Trotskyists, whether they're just ultra-liberals or actual Trotskyists, um, what, I'm, I'm gonna say it online, the ISO are a bunch of ultra-liberals. Um, uh, you know, their position can be everything from, well, actually, let me just, let me be frank. Uh, Trotskyists accept, however imperfectly, the dictatorship of the proletariat. They believe that um, the working class should rule. There's a lot of debate on what that means to have the working class rule. But they fundamentally believe in that, and that there should be a repressive apparatus. Uh, and again, there's a lot of debate on to what extent it should be repressive, who it should repress, what, what ways it should repress. But they accept a repressive apparatus. Negri and Hart don't at all. Um, it, it's an, it, it's the, the term that they love to use is imminent resistance. So rather than have you know a formed core, a formed uh, party or vanguard or army, right? Like the FARC has that resists, and there's a whole swirling society around them. What you do is you resist where and when you can, however you can, um, by slow down to work or you know throwing bricks at cops or um, you know burning down bad buildings like banks or whatever and so this is what they see as their sort of project yeah. um, and for instance the, all the rats in Europe I'm sure they're going like oh yeah this is really cool because nobody told them to go on the streets it's just people going on the streets 
Like it's spontaneous, it's mm. the best really mm -hmm. that's spontaneous okay. gets, right? It's an opportunist position. But to have like somebody come in and be like, okay, but now we should you know organize and prolong this, they would be against that because it's it's one, I mean they're they're making use of sprouts a lot. Um, so it, it's transcendental to the actual multitude of people doing stuff, and it doesn't actually respond to what they would say is their imminent desires or feelings. Yeah. That doesn't really cash out to anybody. I mean, they're, they're using the desire as a lottery, which is that it's a sort of creative desire, and they're also using opposite notes, uh, and then it's a sort of like bubble vibe that leads them to want to do stuff. Yeah, I mean, for any, for any problems Trotskyism might have, and those are numerous, I, I, I think it's clearly better than this autonomous Marxist. Um, part of the reason is what, what has come of it. You'll notice that the theory, again, Trotskyism is not a particularly good theory. It really can't account for what's going on in the world. And we kind of know that it's not a very good theory because all we have to do is look at its track record. It's had very little success. But at least, at the bare minimum, uh, it does a, a fairly good job of mobilizing, and it, it does a pretty good do job of tailing history and pointing at things and being like, oh, that was good. Like, for example, Cuba. Most Trotskyists like Cuba, and they point to Cuba, and they're like, oh, hey, there's less people dying there now. That's a good thing. But autonomous Marxism, you'll notice out of the paper, it's, their literal position on struggle is to create institutions. Now, that's a funny sort of revolutionary struggle that your very goal is to create institutions within capitalism. Right. Now, uh, I mean, going off Lenin, the reform should be a byproduct of revolution. Revolution is not brought about by reform. Um, just as an example, cultural studies, which is hugely under attack, women's studies, um, Chicano studies, uh, black studies, or African studies, depending on where you're at, those were a product of both women's demand for equality and revolutionary struggle for equality. That was the black demand for national liberation. That was the Chicano demand for national liberation that began to create these institutions. But for Negri and Hart, the very goal is to carry on the struggle enough that they get the institution. Um, and that, that, that seems like a losing plan because, as they said, empire uses these institutions to help mediate relations. I don't want a better IMF. I don't want, you know, a better police department, you know, and a, a better riot intervention. I want those gone. And so, uh, in, in a lot of ways, Negri and Hart are also very pessimistic. You know, they, they wrap it up in their optimism. They're very, very pessimistic that, you know, their theory is you have to wait for the productive forces to catch up. Two, the best thing you can hope for is an institution and then three, somehow it turns to communism. I'm reminded of the internet meme, where it's like, buy alligators, and then there's a line, and it says like, question mark, question mark, question mark, and then like a line, and it says profit. And there's this missing step where if you buy alligators, you'll get rich. Well, if you do Negri and Hart's plan, and then you have communism, there's a big gaping hole in how you get from one to the other. I mean, they, they have the concept of exodus, what, and it's sort of like, we're going to take what's ours, and the capitalists, you know, they try to do it, and then we're going to fight it back. They're not necessarily pacifists in a sense, they think that force would come out to it. They're obviously not saying, oh yeah, we should go, you know, bring about the French terror. Um, but, I mean, another thing that's interesting, too, is their analysis of the world isn't like, I mean, they're, they're, they're saying, oh yeah, we've got all these theories about what's going on, but they're not, like, trying to actually prescribe them to the world. What they're saying is like, oh yeah, this is happening, and we think this is what's going on. They'll, they'll like take their analysis that way, but actually don't do it materially enough, in my opinion. But it's just sort of like, oh yeah, well, you know, we noticed that um, people aren't really writing in Washington, they're writing at the WTO in 1999 in Seattle. So that's going on, so we're going to write the book about that. And then it's sort of ad hoc, like, oh yeah, but this is now part of multitude struggles. But it's not like, oh yeah, multitude should be going this way or going that way. It's not well, getting into their desires. Yeah, and also, right, they don't want to set up a new hierarchical system. And you know, having any positive program where you actually say what it is you want people to do would be hierarchical. So you just kind of let it happen. But also, the, the funny thing I noticed, and this is just an observation, is um, traditionally, um, in one of the stuff that's been done, it's like, where does the communist like intelligentsia come from? It comes from the upper strata of society. Just because there's actually more time for people to you know, do think about theory and this sort of thing. But also, the immaterial labor positions are in the upper strata of society. 
And these are the ones that are learning the sort of skills to organize and do stuff, and somehow they'll spread it like this. Kind of a weird parallel. But... Isn't there a, sort of a danger when there's a lack of a, a sort of escape velocity, when there's no minimum program of things to accomplish? I mean, think about it from this perspective. What, um, what sort of political program that anybody is interested in promoting doesn't think that what it's doing is the most equal and fair thing to have? I mean, if you refuse to prescribe a sort of positive program and you literally omit that because you don't want that to be oppressive, then just anything goes. Well, I mean, you have neoliberals, they think that's the fairest, most equal thing that they can do. I mean, aren't you afraid if you're going to assert and be dominant and uh, create institutions that enforce some sort of specific notion of, say, egalitarianism, that you're doomed to just, I don't know, sort of, in a sense, boil yourself alive? Well, uh, so in Empire, in the book, they actually give three demands that they see that, you know, most of should be pursuing in some capacity. One was the, um, the right for everybody to move everywhere um, because we're in a global society now. People should have the freedom of global citizenship to move around. Um, the second was that everybody should have a right to a social wage and that because everybody in society is productive in some means to actually produce in society even as in capital, that everybody should get a social wage. And then the third was, um, I want to say that it was you know, the right to appropriation of what people so that's, that's sort of what they demanded, and also um, in Commonwealth, they, um, they, they recognize that capitalism is in crisis with the financial world back in 2008, but they're like, oh no, that would be terrible if capitalism collapsed now because we're, we're so close to you know, Commonwealth, basically. And so they actually show, say, oh yeah, well, we should do all these reforms where we like, start investing in schools and create technology and these sorts of things. So I mean, they're, they're sort of like given this sort of idea, but um, what, they, what my problem is is they don't flesh out how um, file sharing and you know, writing code and you know, using open source software, these sorts of common projects, um, cash out into some sort of communism, other than just, yeah, there's a bunch of free stuff on the internet for everybody to go to. Couldn't that in a way, though, describe um, Bismarck's policy? I, well, I mean, like, all right, so, hold on, am I making things, yeah, I'm thinking about the correct, so they did, they said the same thing about Bismarck, um, you know, they were starting to develop all those technological innovations in Germany, and then in addition to that, they started to develop all these social programs because people were starting to make demands, some people wanted socialism, they were kind of afraid of that, but they were like, hey, how about we make the small steps, and then give people, like, a retirement wage and sick leave and things like that. I mean, if all we make all these little demands, won't that ultimately just end up us up in a very similar situation to uh, the sort of Bismarck situation or here in the United States, how you know we got the New Deal? Well, I mean, I mean the New Deal is the New Deal for capitalism, not for liberation. Well, I mean, it seems to me though that what they're arguing is, yeah, capitalism shouldn't collapse just yet because we've got all this cool new stuff to do with it. Um, which could lead to communism. And that's, that's essentially just what they're arguing. So we should save capitalism in order to, you know, go further to communism. Right. I mean, which is in what a sense, you know, to describe right. those two historical but all events. This, but all this does is save capitalism. Like, it doesn't get rid of it. So you would agree then, then, that there's no possible way, it's not necessarily impossible, but there's historical precedents for doing the same exact plan and ending up saving capitalism for capitalism's sake. Yeah. It's, it's reforms. That's all it is. One, I mean, the idea that, I mean, there, there are reforms are out there. It's like, yeah, they're radical stuff, you think. Like, yeah, we want, you know, education for everybody. We have a right to a clean environment, these sort of things. One, we're not going to get those under capitalism. So I don't know why they're wasting their time. Like, it seems to me that, uh, and again, this is this goes back to the problem that they're radically anti socialist. Um, I mean, they, they basically want communism now instead of going through a process of socialism, which even seems dumb. It's like, if, if you wanted to actually develop the productive forces to the way where we could have uh, communism, it seems like we should be doing that under socialism, not under capitalism. Um, and and it, the, the problem of uh, Nedry just says, yeah, well, here's the thing, communists, they're against the state, which is true, but also it comes later. Like, I don't think they're missing that point. And again, I think it goes back to a poor analysis of classes, because it's like, what's the state do? It suppresses one, we well, use why one class to suppress another. Well, what happens when everybody's sort of this, this multitude of people doing stuff? Out. 
Can you can you speak more about what their ideas are on, are on the chirotic moment? I it seems to me that again the multitude you know begins engaging in more and more you know, material labor and getting more organized and organized and developing these sort of networks of resistance here and there and everywhere. And at some point, again, it just sort of like basically what they say is I mean there's a passage where it's like oh yeah you know this might not seem like it has a fight for you know some of our friends but. Don't even worry, because when we have Exodus and we take what is ours, um, you know there'll be some fight back then. I mean, I think they actually literally say, "Oh yeah, we'll need some sort of rear guard to help watch our backs while we, you know, shop left capitalism." Baju has a lot of cool terms, and they needed a cool term. And Kairos is a cool word. Kairos <laughs> is a cool word. That's a cool word. So you appropriate some Greek. You have this moment, and you got another cool term. But really. Isn't their moment really just a threshold, though? I mean, it seems to me like that's what they're. It would seem for. to be the, the the point at which the productive forces start into the relations of production such that they change radically. So it's just like oh, when it like when communism is like over it represents over fifty percent of the total. Or sorry, when multitude represents over fifty percent of empire. But I, I would like also that. keep in mind they're ostensibly using Foucault in such a way and losing water in such a way that. Um, it's all about the spread of, and the relationship itself. It's not about like taking over a center of power. Again, they literally say that, yeah, we couldn't, you know, possibly, you know, attack Washington D.C. or Genoa or uh, Tokyo and, and expect it to dissolve the empire overnight. I'm sorry, if an asteroid were just to fall out of the sky and take out Washington D.C., I think we're going to see a lot of changes. So. Everyone might already know this, but autonomous Marxism, the reason they're not giving us a plan to do anything is because they're autonomous Marxists, right? And, and very similar to, uh, I mentioned this in class when we actually had class. When Baju and the meaning of Sarkozy is talking about his eight points of resistance that we can all engage in now, I think that's very much uh, akin to what uh, Hart and Negri think they're doing in Commonwealth. There are these means of tension that if we push hard enough, you're right, capitalism can't possibly sustain. But that's why we push for them. And of course, these two guys writing in their bourgeois lives can't give a face to the revolution. And they think that by not saying anything, by keeping silent, they're making this profound statement. But, but make no mistake, they do it intentionally. The, the revolution comes from those who are in it, who are doing it, not from 75-year-olds, you know, scholars making you know, a bank off terrible novels or books you know, endorsed by Harvard. But, but the Hart and Negri are very aware of that. It's, a, it's autonomous Marxism. They give us points of tension to push for, but it has to come from the people in the street, the people actually doing the rioting, the people actually organizing. And I think that to say, well, they're not giving us a plan is, is sort of a shallow critique, as much as I agree with it. They, they're not giving us any sort of positive prescription to what to do. But it's very particular. That's why they're autonomous Marxism. That's what the definition means. It's autonomous. It's free-flowing, it's spontaneous, it's all of these sort of hack job notions, I agree with that. But that, that is what it means, that is autonomous Marxism. Yeah, I mean, in one breath they'll say, but, oh, we're not going spontaneous, oh, we need some sort of organization. But also at the other end, it's like, but yeah, people also do stuff on their own and, and material. I mean, like, one of the points they harp on Lenin for was, oh yeah, the, 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 some line state revolution, I, I didn't find it. But Lenin basically argues, yeah, but everybody needs bosses, we've always had bosses, so in the revolution they're going to need bosses. But now, labor is autonomous, and in fact, it's trying to get rid of bosses so people can you know, open up the creative process more. So they don't need bosses then, so somehow they'll organize themselves. But you could be so. your own boss, isn't that the neoliberal boy? Yeah. I think the real critique to make there is that who is the boss? Well, it's, it's the immaterial labor who has enough time to sit and have these discussions. It's the first world who gets to sort of lead this spontaneous movement or this, you know, this multitude and its immaterial forces. Like we said, you know, the, the people in, in Colombia are out there engaged in concrete struggle because they don't have certain needs. They don't have food, they don't have water, they don't have roof over that. They, they can't, you know, self-determine their own, you know, five mile radius. I mean, the, the concrete struggle is taken to people like, you know, the, the Palestinians and, and the Colombians, or, or I mean, taken to the, the oppressive forces by the Palestinians and the Colombians. And those are the real forces we should be focusing on, I agree. But hard and angry, I think the real critique is these immaterial movers are the first world. Like we're supposed to really take hold of the reins here. Yeah. Well, of course, right? It would be the first world that gets to lead the revolution, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean to put it bluntly, it's this sort of inverse Maoist third worldism where you know, the rest of the world doesn't have the internet.
know, I don't really have sympathy. I mean, because I'm not very well informed on, on Negri and, and Hart, but I, I mean, wasn't Negri involved in like the, like some... Absolutely. He was, in a lot he was of political waking up at 5 in the morning, activity. going yeah. to the factories, organizing, at 7, going and teaching at yeah. the university, going back, seeing how everything went, going home, writing an essay, going to bed, waking up, doing it. He was definitely engaged. Yeah, he, um, it was Operismo Autonomo, I think what it was. But essentially it was, the, it was workers' power in Italy in the 70s. Um, yeah, he, he was doing all that stuff, like literally going to factories, talking to workers, engaging in this sort of thing. The problem was the movie became so intense, um, and, and this is where the... Uh, Brigadero Rosso, the, the Red Brigades, um, yeah. which were basically sort of like the weathermen um, in Italy, except they actually killed people. Yeah. Um, they, they killed um, the uh, Moro. Yeah, Aldo Moro, the president of the Social Christian, Democratic Christian, whatever. Um, and so what, what happened out of that was um, there was a huge fallout. The government became ultra repressive and started arresting people. And they actually arrested that great and held them all responsible for killing of Aldo Moro. Um, Negri gets elected to Congress, you know, overwhelmingly, their, their representatives or whatever. But also they're like, no, you can't do that. And he's like, well, whatever. And so he leaves the place. Um, that's where he goes and meets, like, Lewis and Watery, and, like, Michael Hart was there from hanging out, doing his thing. Um, so, you know, he picks up the sort of post modernism I mean, like, basically what their project, if you want to boil it down, is it's taking Dallas Capital and mixing it with a thousand plateaus and seeing what we can get out of it. So, um, but I mean, and Michael Hart, the same thing, like he went to uh, Nicaragua and he, uh, El Salvador. He goes to El Salvador and, and it's like, oh yeah, you know, the people there, it's like, you know, it's really cool you guys are coming down here and helping us. And Michael Hart's like, yeah, you know, we'd love to be here. You know, what can we do to help you guys? And it's like, here's the thing, uh, what you should really do is pack your bags, go back to America, and actually make a revolution there. And he's just like, ah, oh, yeah, um, what does that even mean? And it's like, well, you know, it's, it's simple, you know, do you guys have mountains there? He's like, yeah, we got mountains. It's like, okay, well, what you do is you get the guns, you go to the mountains, and you make a revolution. And they're just like, we don't even know what guns to take, man. It's like Reagan's in the White House. Like, there's no way we can do this. And so, I mean, that's that's just sort of like his like, failure for his moments so. ago. Yeah, but didn't you just describe, like, what Cuba was like when they landed on the shore? Yeah. I mean, doesn't it just seem as impossible at that moment as well? Well, I mean, I'm not going to bat Michael Hart. I, mean, I, think I, I know, but right. what I'm saying, though, is like, I mean, it seems to me it's just like this sort of indomitable task of like actually <laughs> committing yourself to that sort of resistance is tough. And maybe perhaps sort of a, you know, maybe a psychological criticism here. Maybe it's just the sacrifice of not being willing to make. We don't need to break that many eggs. Well, and definitely not me that needs to be breaking eggs. Well, right? obviously just, none, none of us agree that we should also go up into mountains with guns, though. I mean, like, he's right in that it's, 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 it's right. different here. But I think some of us have actual commitments to print imperialism from taking over the world. Sure. Well, as a side note, what I, what I would say is, yeah, Negri, Negri was really great when he was doing stuff. Um, there's, a, there's a joke that I love to tell. Um, why do you throw <coughs> a brick through a Hilton window? So Antonio Negri will catch a cold. Um... He doesn't do these speaking tours for free. Um, and, you know, there was a whole steel empire. You know, it's all online. Uh, I don't hear that anymore. They don't talk about people stealing multitude or commonwealth like they did with empire. Um, and again, he's, he's making in the thousands and thousands of dollars on every conference, on every lecture, on every visit. Um, how, how much the, like, it, don't, don't, I mean, don't we even pay people to come? Like, that guy that spoke about Palestine, he brought his book. I mean, we, well, we paid him, we bought his books. Well, here's, here's, here's a big difference. I don't know how much he made. All those guys, they, they made enough to cover their ticket and hotel. That's it. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and... They didn't ask for exorbitant fees either. It was yeah. like, hey, if I can maybe get a hotel room. It was, man. It was about 500 bucks uh, for them. And Josh Sykes, uh, who was from the Free Red Socialist Organization, last year came out on its own dime. Yeah. Um, now, again, if you're just taking airplane, it's possible Negri's only getting airplane ticket and hotel. It's just it's, you know, the Hyatt Regency and it's first class nonstop. Um, and from what I understand, he actually can't teach in Italy. Like, that's what his job is. He's a political scientist before, you know, before it's happened. Um, and I think he's actually in his name more because, again, it's sort of this corrupting influence in the end. He's still alive, right? Yeah. Negri is, yeah. And, uh, I mean, it, the Commonwealth came out in 2009. Um, we're still writing books, unfortunately. Um, but I mean, 
mean, even then, like, it was still Empire, but um, I don't even think they put uh, Commonwealth on there for free. Because, like, they did it with Empire and they did it with Empire. Empire is the only, it's the only one I think. Yeah, it's um, free. It's not on the file sharing. I mean, you can get it online, but they actually have to steal it. Put it on the yeah, yeah, you have to steal it. They're not giving it away. Empire, they gave it away for it. It is not the Commons. <laughs> also, they won't let you print Empire. I mean, in a sense, well, how is it bad? Well, I mean, it seems to me if what you're it's saying is that, like, that when, if, if, if it's a reference to Italy when you know, Negri left, uh, the movement's sort of resolved. I mean, you could blame that on not having the actual concrete movement, like, institute, like a, an institution that they want to say. But, I mean, like, actually having, like, a, a movement that can actually go underground and be the sort of repressiveness of the government, that's actually discipline. Like, they don't have that. They didn't have that in Italy. What I would say is his ideas are not inherently bad. They are concretely bad. Um, it, it's not that there's some, yeah, it's not like there's some fantastic destiny whereby it's a truism for time and all eternity that Negri and Hart are wrong. And if they were writing this in 1870, that it would be great. It would be groundbreaking. But by 19, 1871, we already have, no, as a matter of fact, you don't get communism. This is what people don't grasp. Paris Commune, and this is, again, I'm, I'm making a dig because he didn't come here. But I'll make a dig when I see him next, is this is one of the problems with Trotskyism, some forms of Trotskyism. Marxism is a whole different animal. Um, you don't win the revolution by growing the forces of capitalism. The Paris Commune happens when France is in complete disarray and Napoleon III is under guard by the Germans. The Russian Revolution happens not at the height of the Russian productivity, but when the country is absolutely devastated by war. World War II, we don't get the national liberation struggles because the productive forces of capitalism have grown. We get them because they've been so devastated by World War II they can no longer hold on to their colonial powers. Now, if none of that happened, and in, in fact, it was the most productive countries that were the first to go to socialism, the Negri and Hart would be right. And I would, I would hope, at least, that I would be following Negri and Hart. But the problem is history hasn't shown us that. That as um, the productive forces grow, capitalism is stronger. I mean that it, 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 it's it, it, it should be. It's funny that it's not. I'm not criticizing you or anyone in particular about this, but it's really a very intuitive idea that the stronger capitalism is, the stronger capitalism is. And so, in fact, if we look, it's these ruptures in the weakness of capital, in these weak links in capital, that lead to victory. So. What victory? Well, I mean, you know, the fact that the Soviet Union stopped the Nazis, I think, is a pretty, a pretty good one, which wouldn't have happened had, had the Tsar or the provisional government stayed in power. Um, if you look at the life expectancies across the board, um, communist nations, with the exception of Cambodia, do incredibly well relative to comparable ca uh, capitalist countries. And it's, it's an oddity. It's an, ins it's an amazing oddity if you have a communist country that doesn't have a literacy rate of 99%, and we're talking countries that, you know, grandparents' generation, you'd be lucky to have a 10 or 20% literacy rate. Those are concrete gains. Those are real wins that Negri and Hart don't want to, to accept. Which is well, I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but aren't those victories, as small as they are, or if they are small, outweighed by... Um, the decay of the communist world that exists today. China, Soviet Union's gone. I mean, Cuba, uh, you can say it's still existing, but I think it's giving ground every day to capitalism still. Uh, does, I mean, 
the office, the opposition or the uh, antithesis of what these guys are saying. And I'm not coming from a point where I know what they are saying exactly. Um, but it would seem that, well, the true uh, revolution or a violent revolution will lead to equality, even if it comes at the cost of violent shed. I mean, bloodshed, but uh, have we seen that in history? I, I agree we haven't seen the ability of organizations in capitalism to fight communism, but have we seen the opposite? Have we seen grassroots people's movements not turn into dictatorships? Have we seen the ability of violent, uh, true uh, Marxist communism to fight capitalism any better than what these guys are saying? Well, I mean, that's an, that's an interesting question. And obviously, since we're still under capitalism, we don't have any judgment on what will ultimately kill capitalism. But what we can do is we can look at history and see what destroyed other movements, other systems. And like, for example, you'll notice the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire didn't die in, I mean, and especially if you count Byzant the Byzantine Empire as part of the Roman Empire, as the Eastern District. The Roman Empire didn't die by a violent overthrow. It died a death of a thousand cuts over years and years and decades. And in, again, if you count the Byzantine Empire, even centuries, right? The same thing with feudalism. Feudalism wasn't failed in a single swoop by the American Revolution or the French Revolution. It died the death of a thousand cuts from the Swiss republics and the Italian republics and the Peasants' War and you know, all these other uh, forces and fights that were crushed, that were absolutely obliterated. Um, you know, the Florentine Republic is my, my favorite example. Niccolo Machiavelli uh, is crushed, tortured, and the thing only lasts 30 years and you have the monarchy back. Well, this long process, during those times there was evidence of progress, and I mean strong evidence of, for example, getting rid of the monarchy. You could see how it was concretely changing. For all the failures of, the, of historical, uh, to use the term, really existing communism, they did make significant strides, and not only did they make significant strides, they significantly weakened capitalism um, in ways that I can't point to how file sharing is weakening capitalism. And in fact, we have strong reason to believe that now that we're doing uh, you know, file sharing on your iPhone or on your computer that it in fact is strengthening capital. I can't see an instance where, for example, Karl Kotsky, who was the German Social Democrat, who was espousing more or less the same view without the postmodern update. I can't see where he helped the German working class, but I can see where his views help undermine and betray um, people leading a real revolution. And, you know, like, like Rosa Luxemburg, I can see where this en entered and decayed the moral character of the working class, such that instead of having an internationalist position, which again, Negri and Harper are against internationalism, is backward looking. Instead, they had a, a faux um, you know, critique of ultra-imperialism that at the end of the day just led to the good old fashioned support of imperialism and the good old fashioned support of capitalism, right? We gotta save capitalism for the sake of X. We've gotta support, I mean, this is what Karl Kotsky said. We support German imperialism because it leads to this ultra-imperialism that makes it easier to have unity. The problem is it never gets past that. And so, yeah, obviously, um, Marxism, Leninism, has, has we still live under capitalism, so it hasn't been completely successful. But we've seen Negri and Hart's movement in the ELZN. And yes, the ELZN, the Zapatistas, have made progress. You know, they now have health clinics. But they haven't made the progress that, say, the FARCAS, which are large autonomous regions that are now run by, um, tri you know, village councils and large infrastructure expenditures and um, you know we can see you know this sort of students movement and you know a wiki leaks and all that and yeah okay that does some but that it's the concrete struggles on the ground in India and Nepal that are taking this Marxist Leninist approach that are winning for example the first right to, to be gay and the first openly gay um, politician in South Asia you know that wasn't brought about through coordinating networks of biopolitical production. That was the Communist Party of, or the Unified Communist Party of Nepal, Maoist, saying, no, we're gonna use force in the form of our state to ensure the legal rights of homosexuals. Um, so, I mean, again, yeah, I, obviously it, it, 
it hasn't worked in if you if you define work as the revolutionary overthrow of capitalism, but by any other by any real criteria that, that can be substantiated, it, it's been wildly successful than anything else. And so my point is go with the institutions and program programs that work rather than the ones that are of dubious quality that aren't, you know. Well, to, to trivially summarize what he just said, I mean, uh, capitalists are terrified of the next lights and, and the Maoists and the fall and the Indian Revolution. Are, 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 is capitalism afraid of hard and negative? No. And they're not I, I'm of, sure John McCain is, is, but... Are they, I, I, I don't think they are. But hard and negative, no, nothing they do I see as a, as a direct assault to the capitalism. Well, and, and that might be the brilliance of it. I'm, I'm not saying that Hart and Negri are, are right, but I mean, when we see things like uh, like the Maoists in India, we see them in the jungle and we see trains being blown up, which is great. I mean, but we don't see the Indian government changing. I mean, Tamal Tigers, okay. Um, you know, they're killing people. And I'm not, I'm not saying that. Well, I am saying that's bad, but... I think, like the Green Revolution in, in Iran, uh, that came about by Facebook and, and Twitter and stuff like that. And I think, I'm not sure if that's what Hart and Negri are, are, are saying should be the revolution. Um, but maybe the revolution should be televised, and maybe it should be televised on the internet um, rather than these, uh, these out, of, out of the corner Tamal Tigers in the hills with no communication to the American intelligentsia. I'm not saying that the American intelligentsia are going to do more than the Tamal Tigers, but if they're together, if they're communicating, if we have American universities talking to Iranian school kids, um, I think it has. I think it has a chance uh, for peaceful revolution, possibly. But you're talking about a view that incorporates both aspects, whereas mm -hmm. Hart Negri are saying that what what the Nepal the Nepal and the Maoists are doing is is counterintuitive to, or not counterintuitive, counterproductive to the overthrow of capital. They're saying international struggles are contradictory in themselves. You're talking about a view that incorporates the best of the first world with the best of the third world. I mean, the revolution isn't going to have one paradigmatic form, and to think so is, is extremely parochial, but to, to say that what the, the Naxalites or what any revolutionary, Colombia or, or Palestine or uh, India, to not support that movement as against capitalism, to me that just seems bullshit. Outright, utter bullshit. Well, and I mean, again, there's there's a, there's a lot to be said. I mean, there's one thing, I mean, no offense to you, like you're relatively new to sort of, uh, to a lot of this. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, you haven't gone up on readings. Um, and that's fine. But also, my, my response would be, What's Negri's excuse, right? He's been learning and teaching this for years and years. And in fact, I mean, most of the communiques from the FARC come through um, independently created um, internet, satellite internet that they do while they're on the move. Um, the uh, Maoists in India record everything and transmit it to various you know, journalists throughout uh, India. And they do so through, you know, stolen, stolen bandwidth. Now, that's all, that's all great. And again, I'm, the, the point is not to be a Luddite that, no, you can't use the internet to help things. The point is that as the concrete struggles have unfolded over the last 200 years against capitalism, this position is not new. This position has been espoused. And this is also why I... It's not just that they're wrong. This is why I think they need to be confronted on this. The more people who are taking this position, and, and they, they would say the same about marxist leninists right? And anarchists believe, believe they're right, would say the same about Marxists. And Trotskyists would say the same about, you know, quote unquote, Stalinists. But if you think of you as wrong, and you think of you as hurting the actual concrete struggles, then you would argue against it. So in this case, I think people adopting that Green Heart's view, that hey, yeah, all I need to do is, Microloan to good places in you know in Africa and you know file, steal all my file sharing and then occasionally show up to a WTO thing to throw brick, bricks through the window and then eat you know all sorts of 
interesting international foods because we're now all connected. Um, I think that's a bad plan, and I think it it's a concretely bad plan because it encourages um, self-satisfaction. Um, passing along WikiLeaks is good. I, I don't want anyone not to pass it along, right, and post it to their Facebook. But also, WikiLeaks only matters really on on an international level. The fact that it's carried through. The, um, the, the networks doesn't mean that now we live in an era, era without networks. It now means that we live in an era where those concrete national interests need to be confronted, and they need to be confronted with all sorts of different ways. But if if everyone like reads really <coughs> WikiLeaks and they're like, "Wow, that's really messed up," it doesn't do a whit to stop, you know, U.S. imperialism or et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's actually really funny, and Greg and I were talking about this. It's like, yeah, in one sense, you know, WikiLeaks is sort of this, you know, non-centered, non-hierarchical network of you know, sharing information, whatever, you know, one gets re-territorialized, um, you know, the WikiLeaks site goes down, but oh, then mind the flight, open up new science for your science. And so yeah, it's this sort of weird, closing and watering game going on with WikiLeaks. But also, the real uh, thing we should pay attention to WikiLeaks, it's undermining international relationships, and actually reasserting nation states. Yeah, I take a really issue with the fact that, like, yeah, U.S. imperialism is not really. I don't ever what European imperialism was. It's because the Europe, you know, imperialism is over. We're going to live in an empire now. I think it's just bogus and wrong. Like, it's, it's demonstrably true that the United States is the center of power. That's a really interesting example because it was, as soon as WikiLeaks became a public source, um, <coughs> it, it was really interesting to see how quick nation states divided. Mm -hmm. How quick no one wanted any any uh, communication with the United States because we had jeopardized so much. We saw Russia completely stop talks of, of any sort of uh, communication exchange, and, and Europe did the exact same thing until we figured out our our, our own you know spy situation, which mm -hmm. you know, really demarcates the nation state and imperialism are, are alike now. I think. Well, and and this kind of goes to what Lenin and again this is this is why I'm so critical of. I mean, and, and not really so critical of you. I'm guessing you haven't read Lenin, The Imperialism and the Highest of Capitalism. And if you're new, there's no reason you would read it. There's not, it's not like one of those intuitive books that you just heard floating around, like The Great Gatsby. You're like, oh yeah, I better pick up Lenin, The uh, uh, Imperialism and the Highest of Capitalism. But in it, he argues against Hotsky. And what he says, and it's clear, he's like, yeah, there's big periods of peace. And this was written uh, right before World War I. He's like, yeah, it looks like we're moving towards a global community. It only looks that way because every moment of peace causes the inter-imperialist conflict to seethe underneath. So that rather than you know this apparent peace we're, we have and are moving towards, all it does is reasserts the, the very violence of the inter-imperialist nation state when the peace is broken. And you know, we were moving towards a, a new world order, which is what Negri and Hart would like to focus on after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and oh, you know, the nation state's over. Well, and then we have Iraq, and then we have Afghanistan, and not just the United States, then we have South Ossetia, right? And then we have the conflicts in Ukraine, and uh, you know, Russia over oil, and then you even have talk of the EU, which was, right, empire par excellence, it's basically facing a, a, a position where it either needs to become a nation state and re-territorialize itself, qua nation state, or the various countries and nation states in it are on the verge of ripping it apart. So the solution in, in either case is not empire, is not the deterritorialization of the nation state. It's the reinscribing of the nation state either more strongly or the ruination of international uh, agencies through the nation state breaking away. And, and again, it, this goes back to the critique of Negri Hart. Why don't they see this? Why weren't they able to predict this? Why weren't they able to understand this? Well, the answer is simple. They don't believe in imperialism. And so nation states acting on imperialist motives doesn't make any sense to them. And, and, and again, that's why I think they need to be argued against. Because if you take this view that is wrong, and you do this analysis that it's wrong, the, and the working class, even worse, if the working class takes this as their own tool, they'll constantly be disoriented, because they won't have the analysis to actually be able to know what's going on, 
what the, I mean, obviously, history's not fixed, but, you know, this, they're saying the world is trending in one way. If the working class believe that, and then everything happens to the contrary, they're going to be incredibly disoriented, politically speaking. So. All right, well, um, somebody else got any questions, comments? Uh, I do have maybe a little comment or two. Um, here's the thing. They have this sort of analysis of power that leans a lot on Foucault and then perhaps also on Spinoza or something like this. I think it's worth pointing out that not all sources of power or resistances are equal, nor are they uh, all not equally top down and things like that. I think the criticism probably from a more orthodox standpoint of Marxist Leninism or just traditional Marxism is that um, the social relationship that seems to dominate regardless of things of these other resistances or singularities is they seem to be translated primarily through uh, the capitalist mode of social, uh, social production and nothing seems to be escaping that um, and it doesn't look maybe, I mean theoretically it might be possible that they could reach this chirotic threshold whereby the terms of social relationship are changed. But I think that all the criticisms being made um, from the perspective of Marxist-Leninism hold water, specifically because it doesn't appear like anything like file sharing or these different postmodern subjectivities or anything like that seem to be breaking or even filling up the tank of uh, getting closer to that threshold. So this is why I just don't think that it really holds water. And I, you know, I heard that, you know, during the class, and I think, you know, all the evidence is pointing towards that now. But on top of that, situations where individual, for instance, states or countries can actually set up different forms of social relationships, it is precisely because they are able to form things like national struggles or somewhat separate themselves via the mechanisms of having a nation and not being, you know not being able to resist, I guess, world organizations precisely because they can set up different areas of power, different forms of social relationship. There is hope. But of course, it's not at all through this sort of heart and um, theory or criticism. So I, I guess that's my comment. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I see a South America stand. I mean, they, they sort of try to abduct Bolivia and Commonwealth a bit. I don't know if you read through the whole section. But I mean, what I would argue actually from a Marxist Leninist standpoint is look, you have various nation states um, rejecting US uh, foreign policy, rejecting US imperialism. Uh, Venezuela, um, Colombia is trying to do it, but obviously they have Santos in power, which is directly being funded by the United States. But uh, you know, Bolivia, uh, Brazil, Ecuador, all these places pretty much are just straight up saying no more, no more US imperialism. It's not like, oh, there's this global network of relations imperializing us through imperial processes. They're rejecting the United States, and there's a particular reason why. It's because they're on the brunt end of U.S. imperialism. Right. I mean, but I mean, here might be another example, which I think would be more controversial and more, and also kind of illuminate the problem. I mean, look at a country like Venezuela. <coughs> the number three source of gas or petrol that the United States gets is from Venezuela. But does Venezuela have the ability to segment itself away and create different institutions of power? Yes. It's precisely because it's a nation state and precisely because it can't resist on a national level. You know, so, I mean, it's worth pointing out that literacy is exploding there as well. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I, I just don't think that, yes, obviously people need to trade, you know, especially if you have, like, zero resources in your country. Cuba, again, not a failure of communism, but it's a failure of the rest of the world and the fact that it has to trade with the rest of the world. You know, these are things that are worth considering, but, you know, different power and social relationships are isolated to a community or a particular area that it's not necessarily universalizable. Right. I mean, so. But even then, a, I mean, the, the whole, I mean, this is, this is, um, I'm obviously going to be agreeing with you here too, but I mean, the, the problem with you know, it's, this sort of anti imperialist analysis is it's like, look, the United States is an embargo on Cuba. It's not empire doing this. Also, it, uh, empire. Right, the United Nations wanted them to dissolve this, they would do it. One, they don't have the military backing to give a binding agreement to the United States. The United States can just say, oh, I don't care ever. Um, but two, um, the United States also puts restrictions on other capitalist countries, other places, from actually doing business with Cuba. Um, if, any, if any ship docks within Cuba, 
I believe it's what, six week uh, waiting period. Six through? months. Six mm -hmm. months. They can't dock in U.S. ports. Like this doesn't sound like some sort of global peaceful order imperialist um, imperial as I would say it, not imperialist um, project that they're working towards. I mean, no, sorry. Mm -hmm. Come back to the drawing board. But all right. Um, anything else? Should we go get food? Yes. <laughs> Then I will conclude. Thank you. I was just uh, the, the, the two uh, epigraphs I had on my paper. Where um, this is from Marx. Uh, communism is not for not communism is for us not a state of affairs which is to be established, an ideal which reality will have to adjust itself. We call communism the real movement which abolishes the present state of things. And then uh, from Alain Badiou, without the least hesit least hesitation, Marx would have recognized in Negri. A backward romantic, I believe that deep down what truly fascinates these movements is capitalist activity itself, its inflexibility, and also its violence.